During the pandemic, like good friends do, Jimmy rang up asking how it's going, what was I doing, and apart from walking a lot, <laughs> I said, look, I'm thinking of recording, and I mentioned to him that I'm doing Valentine's Day, I'd shot a clip, and that Casey was going to sing on it, which I was very excited about. Uh, he volunteered, and I took about a half a second to take him up on that offer, so I brought Johnny in to co-produce the album with me, and it was just great fun to work with him, and being in Jimmy's studio, as he said, the world could be on fire, as it often is nowadays, uh, and it was just music bliss in there. It's Valentine's Day. In my decades in music, I've had some fantastic experiences. Having formed a band using an alias of the Rolling Stones, the Cockroaches, I did eventually get to meet the Stones. Had you told teenage me that I was going to meet the Stones, I think I would have had a heart attack. In fact, the photo that I've got with the Stones, my wife reckons I look happier in that shot than on our wedding day. <laughs> it's clearly not the case, but it's a good line. <laughs> uh, I've also instructed my kids to put that shot of me with the Stones in my funeral booklet. Uh, and just in case you're not going to be at my funeral, uh, you can look at it now. Our band appeared on and even hosted shows that we grew up watching, like Countdown. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm John. I'm Phil. I'm Tony Henry. I'm Tony Field. And I'm Jeff Fat. And, and we're, we're the Cockroaches. cockroaches. We toured for a decade and played so frequently that the Daily Telegraph polled band agencies and dubbed us the hardest working band in Australia. Rolling Stone magazine quipped, they are the quintessential meat and mashed potatoes rock and roll band, which I think was a compliment, but either way, it sounded good to me. Thousands of gigs over the years and touring all around the country paid off as our album ended the Sydney charts at number two and eventually went gold and platinum. More albums would follow and we really did more than we ever would hope to do when we first started off. And the cockroaches would eventually subside. But lucky for us, uh, we just changed gears and our musical journey changed and evolved. Well, as the producer and director of the Fab Four of Early Childhood Entertainment, I produced and directed people like Kylie Minogue, John Fogarty from Credence, just an ultimate hero of mine, and, and of course, Slim Dusty. When my children finally put me into the Shady Pines retirement home for old musos, they'll probably have to up my meds to stop me telling stories from the past, but there's more. It's Valentine's Day, the sun shone down, the snow on the ground just faded away, okay. In the midst of this dreadful pandemic, I was very lucky to be able to continue to make music with some friends. And like the whole of Australia and the rest of the country music world, I've loved the music of Casey Chambers, one of Australia's best singer-songwriters. I've seen Casey perform so many times, she's that good. Uh, even in alternate gigs up the Central Coast, she'd do these gigs in a small pub under the title The Lost Dogs, and she'd just do her favourite songs and requests. It was just heaven on a stick. Um, she's a good mate, and in 2019, my wife Pauline and I went with her and her band throughout Africa on a musical safari. It was just awesome, and uh, she was very kind to invite me up to sing a couple of Stone songs up on a helipad in Victoria Falls. And one of the most trippy experiences of my life, let alone musical life, we were on the Masai Mara, uh, and we set up camp, and she just did a little concert uh, with the Fireside Disciples. Uh, and I got up and sang Dead Flowers with her. Cadillac, you're making bets on Kentucky Derby Day. 
and at the start of 2020, I recorded a song written by a mate of mine. Uh, my mate's called Sean Sennett. He wrote a song called Valentine's Day, and I've loved it for years. And uh, so I finally did a version of it. And while I was in Nashville at just the start of 2020, on a day off, I, I shot a clip around Nashville and just got off the, the sights and sounds and crazy people that make Nashville the fantastic place it is. And that was great. And, and so I'd had the, the clip and I had the song, but I always thought it would be a great duet and uh, it would have been great to sing with someone. And of course, you go for the best. And I asked Casey, would she sing on it? Which um, she did. You will stay. Casey sent me her performance on Valentine's Day. Uh, she said, look, I've really changed this up a bit. Um, uh, you know, I hope, hope you like it. Hope I didn't bring it up. <laughs> In classic self-deprecating Casey way. Uh, she sure as eggs didn't, as you'll hear. Um, just an amazing performance. I remember getting it, being so excited to hear what she'd done with it and playing it to some of my kids who were in the house at the time. And my daughter, Claire, uh, said to me, Dad, yeah, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Is there any way you can just lose your vocals and keep Casey's? <laughs> so yeah, she did get up. In 1979, it was my first year out of school, and I might add a boarding school. So I was ready to enjoy life. Uh, and I went to a ball at Sydney University, and in those days, you would pay a set amount, and you would get the whole night no extra charge. So you'd drink as much as you want, eat as much as you want, and there were bands. The bands that night, I'll never forget them, Ann Kirkpatrick, Richard Clapton, Mental as Anything, and Cold Chisel. Uh, so I was just in heaven and I was right at the front rocking out and while Cold Chisel was singing, Jimmy was uh, swigging from a bottle of vodka and very kindly <laughs> handed to a few of us up the front and we took a slug from it. It was a great night and that was the first of a few drinks I've had over the decades with Jimmy. I'm friends with Paul. Oh, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, Cultures were a young band, um, and uh, Paul's band, the Cockroaches, and Cultures, we used to play the same sort of gigs. Both of our heavy touring schedules, we often crossed paths, and they were also very different personalities and had very different lifestyles. And, and I always got on really well with him. You know, Paul was one of those guys who loved music, who was so enthusiastic about music, and he knew more about music than I'll ever know. <laughs> he still does. Um, and he's a great singer. We shared a lot of the same musical tastes. I love rockabilly, and you know, there's a lot of rockabilly in Chisel, and so many other genres and styles. And that whole love of music has been the basis of a, a long, long uh, friendship. I've been waiting for years for Paul to do a solo record, and finally he did one. And not only that, you know, I, I was thrilled and honoured to, to get the uh, to get a Guernsey to get asked to sing with him. Uh, you know, um, Bob the Bob Dylan song that we did, "You Ain't Going Nowhere," is a great song. And when Paul suggested it, I just jumped at the chance. Uh, this is Paul's first solo album, as you can see. He had, looks like he's got the same hairdo as me. Um, you know, I think we got the same barber. <laughs> In 1989, I organised a fundraiser and an awareness raiser for Red Nose Day in the battle against SIDS, that Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, as my baby girl Bernadette died from Sudden Infant Death Syndrome at the age of seven and a half months in 1988. Jimmy was the first artist to say he'd be there at this concert called Crater Rock. And it's the first of countless charity events and things he's done over the decades. And most of it is under the radar. He's a good man. 
in an, one of many great memories over the decades, Jimmy asked me to sing with him at the Emerald Ball, which is an annual event which raises money for the children's rehab unit at Westmead Hospital. And I'd sung with him once before on an uh, early rock and roll song called Shake, Rattle and Roll. <laughs> great fun. But he upped the ante a little bit. He said, can you, you come coming this year? And I went, yeah, absolutely. He said, do you want to sing with me again? I said, sure, of course. And he said, great, we'll do good times. And you do the Michael Hutchins bit. So no pressure. <laughs> but I've got to say, if Jimmy's on stage singing with you, that's all you need. It, it was great. Great fun, terrifying, and just awesome fun. said to him, I'm going to do songs I love, and I love Bob Dylan's song, so we did a Bob Dylan song, You Ain't Going Nowhere. But he's a dear friend, he's a great singer, and I am absolutely thrilled to be a part of this record. Thanks for having me, Paul. Climb that hill no matter how steep, when we come up to it. And so we went into Jimmy's studio and started recording 12 songs. Um, so it went from an EP to an album. Absolute joy to be recording this in such a lovely studio. And, and also to have some of your favourite musicians there working with you. So during the pandemic, instead of binging on comfort food, or should I say in addition to binging on comfort food, <laughs> I binged on things that brought me joy, which was making music. The My brother John, who was the main songwriter for The Cockroaches, and he wrote and co-wrote our biggest hits, and of course, huge hits for The Wiggles as well. I used to call him for many years, Mr. Hot Potato. Uh, and I got Johnny to co-produce the album with me because he could speak the language of music with the musos themselves and talk about being up a semitone and things I just don't know what they really mean. Uh, and, <laughs> and he's a lot of fun. Paul rang me up and said he was doing an album. I said, oh, great. And then we were starting to think about where we could do it and all that. And, um, and, and Barnsley offered him his studio and we said, OK, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. It was instruments everywhere. It was a wonderful place. Good sandwiches around the corner. That's important. And we just hauled in everyone we knew. We co-wrote a couple of songs together. Uh, so the song that opens the album, This Way to Love and Happiness, what a great song. This Way to Love and Happiness, we needed BVs on it and we got the great team of Rhea Pirelli and Chrissy Thomas on it because we needed them and it sounds fantastic, I knew they'd do a great job. Phil Grove on piano gave us the opening intro, it was fantastic on the Parlings piano. Big, giant, upright. This Way to Love and Happiness was actually a, a sort of a dream I had that you, you're going through life and there's a, 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 a dude you meet who literally says, this way to power, this way to... And he's, 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 he's leading you wherever you want to go and, and he says, this way to love and happiness and you, you take that path. And there's all these different ways your life could go. So, um, yeah, we did that together, another song called Alison, You're the One. Uh, so apart from the songs I love, we also created something new. We did a few uh, originals, but you're also paying homage to these songs you've grown up with, these songs you love, these songs you're obsessed with, and it's, it was great to do our version of them. Um, not changing much, but sometimes uh, bringing your own flavour to it. It was just you know, a, a creative buzz, great time. Always great doing music anywhere, but in such a nice setting, it was really nice. 
So we got to work with, you know, a lot of our friends and favourite musos, as I mentioned, Jimmy, of course. Singers like Rhea Pirelli, who's um, from Audio Vixen, who Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees literally got uh, to support them. Uh, she's that good a singer. And I duet on Sleepless Nights with her, which is one of my favourite songs of all time. You go, don't you know. Sounds a very simple song, but it goes somewhere that you don't expect to chord wise. Um, when you see the chords, everyone, Phil, me, everyone went, God, I didn't think it would go there. It's such, such a great bit of writing, it's such an unlikely bit of writing, really. Um, beautiful, beautiful song. Um, and it has to be played with steel guitar. You cannot do it without steel guitar. We had Graham playing beautifully on it too. I hide the tears. So it's a bit of a mountain to climb if you think of the huge people that have done it, but actually not a lot of people know it and not a lot of people have played it. From the Muse's point of view, they actually say it's a difficult song. It's not the usual chord progression, that kind of stuff. So thank God I know nothing about that type of stuff. Uh, I left that to them. I begged Bill Chambers to come down from the coast to play on this album and uh, he did. So I've got him on slide guitar, 12 string, ukulele, mandolin, electric, all forms of guitar he played on because he's awesome uh, and a lovely bloke too, including one track of course, a Buddy Miller song called Gasoline and Matches. He's actually played with Buddy Miller on stage. Uh, so if, if that's not a credential to play on a Buddy Miller track then what is? Uh, and he was just awesome. We, uh, Johnny and I, we've used him before on a Field Brothers album and we just sit back and just love him every night he plays. A great bloke too and uh, cooks a mean sausage. We went up to his place uh, recently and did a, a live um, uh, show. Uh, but Bill Chambers just smashed it. You make me feel a spark. Yeah, I, I brought in mates from bands of mine, uh, my rockabilly band, The Sacred Hearts. Johnny O'Grady was out on the double bass and electric bass, so he joined Phil Grove on the keyboards, uh, Steve Pace on the drums, Graham on the pedal steel, as we saw before. Amazing players and just good mates. We knew it was going to be fun and they loved the experience as well. It's just fantastic and I remember Phil, having Phil Grove is a fantastic piano player, having in there and, and, and actually it's funny in, in, in the studio there, um, Jimmy actually said to Paul, there's a Yamaha, beautiful Yamaha piano and there's this old upright. He said, use the old upright, that's, um, that's the sound. Jimmy said, uh, asked about who was playing piano and he said, you've got to use the piano that's in the studio. I went, oh, he's got his own. He said, no, 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 you have to use that. It's what Don Walker's played on in the last few Cold Chisels album. It's an amazing thing and uh, uh, gives the album a certain flavour. So, so you don't hear it, that sound much, you know, this, this particular piano, you know, rather than everyone uses the beautiful Yamaha. And you know it's going to be a great experience when even the instruments in the studio are famous. <laughs> if these lovely things don't hurt you Our love just wasn't meant to be Is there such a thing as an obscure Elvis Presley song? Well, I reckon there is. Every Sunday, growing up in a family of seven kids, we would watch Elvis movies on Sunday Arvo TV. And we saw them all. And as you know, the Elvis movies range from really actually great ones, like the early ones, Jailhouse Rock, Love Me Tender and so on, to really fun, disposable ones, you know, uh, Harem, Scarum, you name it, right? Uh, Viva Las Vegas. Our whole family got taken to the sea back, by the way. Thank you, Mum and Dad. Uh, anyway, it happened at the World's Fair. Uh, has a gem, as there often are in Elvis movies. You know, a lot of fun, disposable songs. But this one called They Remind Me Too Much of You. It's just probably the most beautiful love song ever written. Uh, and so I did that. Of me. This album's full of songs that I love, and some of them I've been singing forever. Uh, our first gigs in, in the Cockroaches days were when I was a teenager. My brothers were all teenagers. The whole band were teenagers. So was our audience. And playing the Australian Heritage Hotel in King's Cross, and uh, we were playing on a Sunday Arvo there, and this young woman came up to me and said, can you sing that song, you know, the Kangaroo song? 
went, nah, no, we don't do that. We, we, we don't do any kangaroo songs. She went, yeah, you did it last time I saw you, you know? I said, sing it to me. She went, every time that you, wild kangaroo, which reflects on my bad pronunciation, uh, every time that you walk in the room. So I've been singing this song since I was 16, 17, uh, and I had to do it for this album. It's just, it's one of the great love songs. Every time that you, I mean, yeah. we all knew it was coming, but he thought, is he going to do well, it? At the end of the session, we go, for fuck's sake, am I the only one that listened to anything? <laughs> I, I, I hope you were ready to pack up if you didn't. So we're doing Walk in the Room, which has the signature riff, you know. And it's, it's really played on a 12 string. Luckily, at, at the Barnsley studio, there's a Rickenbacker just hanging there. Rickenbacker 12 string. So Bill Chambers gets on the 12 string, tries to play it. It just didn't do it. It didn't sound good. It didn't, it didn't, wah, wah. So Bill quite brilliantly went, I've done this thing. I still don't know what he did. He gets four strings on his guitar, restrings. He's there for about 10 minutes, restringing. And I get, you okay? Yeah, she said, yeah, I got you. He said, I don't know if it'll work. Anyway, with a four string guitar, he apes a 12 string sound. I don't know how he did it. Only Bill knows how he did it. It's like the Beatles' Hard Day's Night. The opening chord, people don't know what it is. How did Bill Chambers get the 12 string, the four string to sound like a 12 string? I still don't know, but there you go. It's, um, it's a great version, a very nice version of Walk in the Room. And it is such a brilliant song. Probably in my top five songs I've ever written. It's got every chord you need, every, literally. Every every possible chord you'll need in a song. If you learn Walk in the Room, you can write songs. I got to work with so many great musos and singers and friends. Uh, Chrissy Thomas, who duets with me on Gasoline and Matches, just kicks it. She also sang on chorus on a few other songs as well. She did an amazing job. Matches, you pull my this is a fantastic song. I, I, I love this song. And actually, when we heard it for, and, and I just thought of Chrissy Thomas, who's got such a great rock vibe, just such a great bluesy rock vibe. So she's did a magnificent job on it. Um, she knew the song anyway. Uh, and uh, it delivered. The you and me, the you and me, oh, baby, I'm incarcerated. And of course, Ellie Mae Barnes, who I've seen many times at the Low 302 Cabaret in Sydney. I've jumped up with her a couple of times to sing a song and of course work the smoke machine. It's, uh, if you haven't seen Ellie Mae's cabaret show, it's one of the things in life you've got to do. She's hilarious, she's fantastic, so sweet and entertaining. And uh, also, which, if you know her, you would know this, a Dylan fanatic. Um, so uh, there's a beautiful Bob Dylan song, Tomorrow is a Long Time, which I've loved forever. And I want to do a real sweet version of it, like gentle, and that's the definition of Ellie Mae's. It's not a crooked trail. You don't hear this song as, as, as two people singing it, and so um, we just built a key change into it, and it worked really well. Um, uh, it's a great, great song. I love this song. And, and uh, Ellie Mae obviously knew Dylan's version of it very well. I, I like her phrasing on it. I thought Ellie Mae sang it perfectly, and uh, her phrasing just reminded me so much of Bob's version that it, was, uh, it felt like home to me. Um, and uh, gorgeous tune. They worked really well together, the harmonies worked. It was one of those moments you go, oh, this is, this is a big payoff, this is working beautifully. You know, having it in two different keys worked well. So, uh, very proud of the song. The funny thing is though, when she turned up for the session, both she and I were wearing Rolling Stones things, which is great. So, I'm a huge Stones fan. Both wearing a Stones thing to do a Dylan song. I don't know, the universe was talking. Then I'd lie in my bed once again. It's great also working with Jack, who of course is a guitarist and singer in The Preachers, who are a great Aussie band. Um, and when you've got an engineer working with you, it's fantastic if they are a muso, because again, they can cut to the chase, they can give an opinion of, no mate, you need to do that again, or great as he was, very constructive, and Jimmy was happy it was someone working his gear who knew what he was doing. So uh, it was great having Jack on board. 
And not only is this production international, shot in Nashville, recorded in Sydney, uh, but it's mixed in Bris Vegas. So up in Brisbane, of course, Sean Sennett, who wrote Valentine's Day, is there. But Jason Milhouse, who's an, uh, a, a sound recordist, a muso himself, I got him to mix the tracks. He did a great job on Sean and Rob Hurst's album and EPs. Uh, does a lot of country artists as well. Um, so yeah, Jason, great bloke, great muso, uh, and he was the, the final piece of the puzzle. She's a sight for so eyes Waiting for a factory girl So there you have it, Love Songs for Lonely People. My first solo album after all this time, working with people I love on songs I absolutely adore. And hopefully in these troubled times, it'll bring you comfort, make you ache for the ones you love, like everyone should. Dig it. Mm -hmm.